Hola, buenos tardes a todos. I will be presenting in English on Murray Rothbard's Chapter 4 of Economic Thought Before Adam Smith, which are on the late Spanish scholastics. Uh, even Professor Jesus Huerta de Soto really stresses the importance of the scholastics. He actually said he wants to fight to rename the Austrian school the Spanish school. Um, so, beginning with an overview of the importance of the Spanish scholastics, I will also be uh, discussing the history of the Spanish scholastics and then their impact uh, today on the world of economics. So, the question is why are the Spanish scholastics important? Well, um, Murray Rothbard considered the Spanish scholastics the proto Austrians, as they are, in a way, the intellectual and social precursors to the Austrian economies. Um, and what we have to understand in the history of Spain is that out of the Renaissance period, we had a movement towards absolutism, where the kings really wanted to state their claim, no pun intended, and impose many taxes and reduce the ability for foreign market exchanges to exist. What this led to was a decrease in the prosperity of the world and these lower standards of living also helped influence what became uh, the, the, the plague or the Black Death that wiped out close to a third of the lives of the Europeans. Um, as well, these Spanish scholastics were mostly Dominicans, then became Jesuits and taught mostly at the University of Salamanca. No, not all of them. Um, they used uh, they were followers of St. Thomas Aquinas, and, and in the line of deductive, deductive logic, they were um, theologians and definitely taught the economic laws. So, the Spanish scholastics had many insights onto subjective value, the importance of the free market, voluntary exchange, and basic monetary economics. I'm not sure why that's cut off, but um, unfortunately, what that says is they were advocates of of uh, human uh, rights, um, well, natural rights. They were big proponents of natural law, natural rights, property rights. They were anti-absolutist. They wanted freedom to contract and to trade with all people. Um, so in that sense, they were humanitarians. Now, uh, shoot, unfortunately, that is cut off quite a bit, but that's all right. Um, the, as we see here, this is going into the 16th century. So, as I stated earlier, what happened at the fall of the, the Italian Renaissance in city-states and out of this Great Depression was the ability for specifically the Spaniards and the Portuguese to become world empires. What they were able to do was explore the world. They had the most incredible explorations. They were able to go north, south, east, west, to um, Cuba, discovering the New Indies. And what, what resulted was their ability to bring back much of the gold and silver. What happened, though, was they, when they brought back the gold and silver into the, the ports of Spain, specifically in Sevilla, um, there was an increase. This was an inflation, an increase in the money supply. So the prices rose. Uh, they doubled in the first half of, half of the 16th century and then tripled by the end of the 16th century. And as this money spread out to Europe, um, the price of goods increased, but they, they reached Spain first. So, as we can observe, the prices in Spain, uh, due to the fact that they were the first receivers of the new money, increased, and then over time the money flowed outward and expanded out throughout Spain. Um, now, going into the Spanish scholastics um, and their, their economics, uh, in, okay, specifically in the economics of the Spanish scholastics, they discovered the exi existence and universality of economic laws. So through their deductive reasoning, the, as precursors to the Austrians, we disregard the empiricists or the ec economists that like to use mathematical models. And so what, what the Spanish scholastics derived was mostly the subjective nature of value. Um, they discussed the diamond water paradox. Why is it that water is more, has more utility to humans 
than a diamond diamonds do, but yet diamonds are more expensive. Well, they were approaching the fact that it's due to marginal utility. On the margin, water is way more abund abundant and more useful, uh, whereas diamonds are less abundant, but uh, they, they are just valued more, but this is all subjective. They uh, developed the laws of demand and supply, the quantity theory of money, where if you increase the money supply over time, prices will adjust and increase as well. And they observed the cause of inflation. Um, and so they also really thought about fractional reserve banking, and there was a dispute among them, the Spanish scholastics, as to can we have 100% reserve banks or can we have fractional reserve banking? What, what is the situation going on there? As well as they really heavily discuss, discuss usuries um, and, and interest, and can you charge prices on loans and interest rates? Is this moral? This was a moral question to many of them. Or is this just another part of economics and exchanges where people are allowed to charge for the money they don't have or look for investments as far as uh, their time preference? Do they value something in the future rather than in the present current state? And um, so beginning with some of these Spanish scholastics, we have uh, Carmel. Uh, time. And in the first generation of Spanish scholastics, oops, the list here, we have um, the founder of the School of Salamanca, Francisco de Vitoria. And he was a moral theorist who really began this, the School of Salamanca's tradition of denouncing the conquest and particularly the enslavement by the Spanish of the Indians in the New World. So that really set the tone for what the Spanish scholastics were after. They're not just after um, ideology, but also what is the most, uh, the best means for achieving peace and prosperity. And um, that came from Francisco de Vitoria. One of his students was Domingo de Soto. I will know him, but he was uh, very intelligent, but his economics were not so good. He was a reactionary economist, and he was also the most status of the Spanish scholastics. In a way, he regressed the economic theories that the Spanish scholastics were developing. Now, we also have Martín de Azpilicueta Navarras. He was the first economic thinker to state clearly and boldly that government price fixing was imprudent and unwise. As well, he looked at when goods are abundant, there is no need for maximum price control. And when goods are scarce, controls would do the community more harm than good. He also developed the theory of money in the quantity theory and money's purchasing power. What he said was, other things being equal in countries where there is a great scarcity of money, all other saleable goods, and even the hands of labor of men are given for less money than where it is abundant. The reason for this is that money is worth more where and when it is scarce than where and when it is abundant. So, What's really something nice to notice is that this is all deductive reasoning and methodology. This is not what I'm frustrated with, which is the mathematical models of economics. So this is really beautiful. Um, and so then uh, we have Juan de Medina, who developed um, interest and uh, stated that that the charging on a loan is legitimate if in compensation to the lender for risk of non-payment, uh, at what he developed this. But his reasoning was impeccable. He said, uh, or exposing one's property to the risk of being lost is sellable and purchasable at a price, nor is it among those things which are to be done gratuitously. Furthermore, Medina pointed out, theologians now admit that someone who guarantees a debtor's loan can licitly charge 
for that service, but in that case, the borrower cannot find a guarantor, why cannot the lender charge the borrower for assuming the risk of non-repayment? Isn't his charge similar to the charge of the guarantor? Now, entering into the middle years of the school of Sal Salamanca, you have Diego de Cabarrubias, who really developed the subjective theory of value. In his work, Ver Verriero, uh, he discussed that the value of goods on the market is determined by utility and by the scarcity of the product. Of product. He also developed the idea that it's estimations in human beings um, in the values of present goods and future goods that determine um, value. And he also wrote, the value of an article does not depend on its essential nature, but on the estimation of men, even if that estimation is foolish. In the Indies, wheat is dearer than in Spain because men esteem it more highly through the nature of the wheat, though the nature of the wheat is the same in both places. Um, so. And following Cavarubius was Luis Saravia de la Calle, who uh, in his work Instruction de Mercados, which is Instruction for Merchants, explains for the first time that the correct relationship between prices and costs is not that the cost determines prices, as Adam Smith and the other classical economists explained, but rather it is exactly the opposite. It is that prices of things determine the cost. As well, he said, the just of price arises from the abundance of scarcity of goods, merchants, and money, and has been said, and not from cost, labor, and risk. If we had to consider labor and risk in order to assess the just price, no merchant would ever suffer loss, nor would abundance or scarcity of goods and money enter into the question. As well, De La Calle considers the entrepreneur to be a merchant, and this is very central to the Spanish scholastic thinking, which is that human beings are endowed with free will, instead of the predestined nature that the uh, Calvinists and Protestants were trying to promote. But that um, uh, this free will idea is essential to, is someone's ability to be an entrepreneur or a merchant is that something that is predestined, or is that innate in them? Can they choose this path for their life? Um, following these men, or... Tomas de Mercado, and Francisco Garcia. But I'll leave them for now. Now, going into the late Salamancans, we begin with Domingo de Bainez. And uh, he really was a supporter of determinism, while his contemporary Louis de Molina was in support of free will. And um, Louis de Molina discussed how he was a, a primarily a monetary theorist. He said that wherever the demand for money is greatest, whether for buying or carrying goods, conducting other businesses, waging wars, holding the royal court, or for any other reason, there will its value be highest. As well, he revived the active natural rights and property rights theories of his predecessors. That was
Following Luis de Molina was Francisco Suarez, who I consider to be a minarchist. He had a much more restricted view of the just power of the king, and he discussed that the power of the king is in no sense a divinely created institution, since political power by natural and divine law devolves solely on the people as a whole. Explaining the idea that, you know, if men, uh, people come together and they develop a society that creates a state, it is still in the people's uh, inherent right to choose what happens with their destiny, rather than the king and imposing his divine royalty. Now, following Suarez, we get into the, the last Salamanquins, who were Lesios and De Lugo. Um, these men, Alasius, really developed uh, the wages in the labor market as well as the psychic benefit and psychic income, which goes into more psychology. Um, entrepreneurship, guaranteed investment control, which is lender's risk, and charging for a lack of money, which is dealing with time and interest. Um, and then Juan de Lugo, who was considered to be the greatest moral theologian since Aquinas. As well, he developed the subjective utility explanation um, and then really created the debate between subjective value versus objective use value. Um, what was very important was that De Lugo raised the question Is it within the capacity of human beings to discover the equilibrium price of things? And what he uh, came away with was that saying that. The fair price for equilibrium price of things depends on such an enormous number of circumstances that only God can determine what that is. And I think this really set up um, the foundation for Hayek's knowledge problem in a society, or a social society. Now, Jesus Puerto de Solo, uh, in his article on the Austrian scholars, helped develop the ten essential principles of the Spanish scholastics that were the foundation for the Austrian economists. And what these are is the subjective theory of value, discovering the correct relationship between prices and costs, the dynamic nature of the market process, and the impossibility of equilibrium model. The dynamic concept of competition understood as a process of rivalry between sellers, the rediscovery of the principle of time preference, the distorting influence that the, I believe, quantity of money has on the relative, the negative economic effects generated by fractional reserve banking, the essential economic fact that uh, part of the money supply, the impossibility of organizing a society with coercive mandates due to the uh, provided, um, the traditional liberal principle and the unjustified interventionism um, of an economy violates natural law. So with this being said, this brings me to my favorite Spanish scholastic, and that is the great Juan de Mariana, who said, Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder should ever be the way this is in Juan de Mariana. Juan de Mariana, who said, people should not be afraid of their governments, but governments should be afraid of the people. It's not Juan de Mariana either. What is this? <laughs> Juan de Mariana, who was charged by King Philip II to write a pamphlet for the future King Philip III in how to be a great king. What Juan de Mariana wrote was the reggae et regis institutions on the monarchy and its royal institutions. From this pamphlet, he derived the creative idea of tyrannicide. What King, uh, uh, to, what Juan de Mariana defined tyrannicide or a tyrant as is a king who disregards the, the subject's rights. Uh, he levies taxes without its subject's permission. As well, he organizes secret police forces, and um, the last being that he prohibits meetings and assemblies. The conclusion Juan de Mariana came with was that 
It is legal in these circumstances to murder that tyrant. Now, this sounds like an empire I used to know, these conditions. But what is important about this idea of tyrannicide is that... Um, Okay, so what, what's important about this idea of tyrannicide is that it was, this book was publicly burned in France because it was justified in the murdering of King Henry III and King Henry IV. Now, in Spain, they did not burn this book nor prohibit it because they thought it was written in Latin, so it wouldn't have much of an impact on the people in Spain, as well as I hear that what people like in Spain, uh, the people in France do not really like it. Um, as well, it is with uh, great pride that when Thomas Jefferson was beginning the ideas of revolting against the king of, uh, of the, the British, it was James Madison who gave him a copy of Juan de Mariana's book on the history of Spain, which was a perspective of unmasking the tyrants from the position of the citizens. So, um, uh, this, this, following this idea of, of tyrannicide, there was another book written by Juan de Mariano, which was De Monate Utone, uh, on the alteration of money. And what this was, was the fact that King Philip III, indeed, he debased the currency. How did he do this? He took the silver coins and he clipped the silver from the coins, and so it was just copper coins. What resulted was a, an increase in the amount of coins in the economy, and with the increase of the money, there was now um, an increase in the prices, because where did the, these, this new money come to pay for these goods? And what resulted was an increase in the prices. And what resulted from that was a complete destruction of the economy in the fact that prices could not be allocated efficiently. This massive inflation just created a massive distortion in the economy, which hurts it hurts the people, it, it pauperizes the people, it pauperizes the poor people the most, unfortunately. But the, the kings and empires, um, they don't care. So um, following the the Spanish scholastics and you had the Protestants and the Calvinists really pushing out the Spanish scholastics out of the church. Um, Catholicism was changing their ideas of what they accepted as allowable opinion. And um, unfortunately, going into the, the 18th century with the classical economists, you had uh, the uninformed economist um, Adam Smith, who really laid the groundwork for uh, the, the labor theory of value with the objective theory of value. He thought that, that, that uh, value was objective. And so this, this allowed for Marx and his uh, uh, companions to develop these ideas because Adam Smith didn't know the Spanish scholastics theory of economics. And what resulted from that was a century, the worst century, uh, that the history of the world has ever seen with the most famines, deaths, wars, destruction. Quite unfortunate. Um, now, Elias Huber has composed an article titled uh, Carl Menger and the Spanish Scholastics. And what he looked at was if Carl Menger was indeed influenced directly from the Spanish Scholastics. Um, and he took Menger's library and looked for all the footnotes, as well as other German authors, to see if they were indeed influenced by the Spanish classics. There was not too many um, annotations from the Spanish classics, so the conclusion that Elias walked away with was that um, the, the evidence we found says no, that the Spanish classics influenced Karl Menger. However, I like to, to agree with De Soto, that uh, no, the, the Austrians were indeed heavily influenced by the Spanish classics. And I will conclude by reading a quote that um, Jamie Baumes wrote discussing Father Juan de Mariana, and this applies to the other Spanish classics. This is the same um, conclusion that uh, 
Professor Huerta de Soto ended his speech on about the Spanish scholastics. And it says that consummate theologian, perfect Latinist, profound connoisseur of Greek and Eastern languages, brilliant writer, esteemed economist, politician of high foresight, here is his head. Add an irre irreproachable life, a severe morality, a heart that does not know fictions, incapable of flattery that beats vigorously to the mere name of freedom, like that of the fierce republicans of Greece and Rome, a firm, intrepid voice which rises up against every line of abuse without regard to the great ones, without trembling when it addresses the kings, and consider that all of this is found together in a man who lives in a small cell of the Jesuits from Toledo, and you will certainly have a set of qualities and circumstances that very rarely come together in the same person. Thank you.